Okay, it's 6.03, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I just kinda wanna introduce myself and some of our speakers here. I am Casey Harriet. I am the R3 coordinator for the state of Oklahoma, ODWC and National Wild Turkey Federation. And so basically I create programs and initiatives that get people hunting and get them outside, educational content. Um, and today we have with us, we have Oklahoma Hunters and Anglers, um, President and Vice President. So Rick, are you president? Okay, we got Rick Nolan here, who's president, and then Vice President Bobby Armstrong over there. And uh, they're going to be talking to us a little bit about the deer hunting basics, going over some safety stuff, rifle basics, deer hunting strategies. And then I have Jacob Harriet here, my husband, who is the Lincoln County Game Warden, who's going to go over the regulations, everything you need to know to be legal out in the field. And then I'm going to go over a little bit of public land um, topics or public land access and availability here in the state. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Rick. I'm going to pop your PowerPoint up on my page, okay? And uh, and then we can you can just kind of prompt me through it, uh, the the slides, okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk just a little bit about strategies, gear, and setup, and not necessarily in that order. So, Casey, you want to skip to the next one? Yes, sir. So, when we talk about gear, and, and if anybody has any questions while we're going through this, uh, Casey, do you want to handle all those at the end, or how do you want to handle that? Sorry, I was trying to get myself unmuted. Yep, that's one thing I should have mentioned before. If we have questions as we go along, let's just type them in the chat box and then I'm gonna field them for everybody, all the experts at the end. And um, that way we can have a designated uh, Q&A at the end of this. Thank you okay. for reminding me. So kind of my philosophy on, on gear and what you need is just keep it simple. Uh, don't overthink it. Don't watch too much TV and YouTube. Just keep it very basic and very simple. And I will tell you that for most deer hunting situations, you do not need camouflage. Um, you know, it's kind of a trendy thing to wear, but it's it's not necessary uh, to kill a deer. To, you don't have to have the latest and greatest camouflage. So don't get too wrapped around the hub on that. I do recommend that you wear dark colored clothes. Um, any kind of clothes will work as long as they're comfortable and dark. Um, but I would avoid blues and yellows. Um, deer can see blue and yellow, uh, so I would kind of stay away from that. Uh, but you know, an, an exception to that, and there's always an exception, you know, the last deer I killed was a couple of weeks ago. I shot a, I shot a doe with my bow at 12 yards out of a ground blind, and I was wearing blue jeans. Of course, I'm sitting in a ground blind, and the deer can't see those blue jeans, and I'm wearing a, a dark uh, black, uh, pullover shirt so I blend in well with the interior of that uh, ground blind so just keep it simple don't get too wrapped around the hub on having to have the latest camo just wear what's comfortable of course if you're hunting with a with a gun or hunting even with archery equipment during any of the gun or muzzleloader seasons and Jacob can cover that uh, better than I can but hunter orange is required and keep in mind that hunter orange is okay to hunt in because deer can't see orange, so you're fine. And I guess the two most important nope. things, I'm sorry? The two most important things to me, especially with, with kids getting in the field, is dress uh, in warm layers. If it's cold, dress according to the weather and dress in layers. And kiddos and Quite frankly, old fat guys like me, we need to be comfortable while we're out there or we won't have fun. So just dress according to the weather. Go ahead. Uh, when you think about gear, you know, my mind goes to ground blinds, tree stands and all that stuff. Uh, while that stuff is nice and handy and can be some advantages to it, it's not really necessary to have. I've killed a lot of deer. Just sitting on the ground, just as long as you sit still, uh, just sitting on the ground, get, getting comfortable, uh, even getting in a chair and sitting in a chair. If you're well concealed, you can kill just as many deer. You just kind of have to be still. 
I think binoculars are really nice to have. It helps you, especially, you know, out even past 20 or 30 yards, identifying if a, if a antlerless deer is a button buck or if it's really a doe, it just helps me. And so I would encourage you to get a nice pair of binoculars because they are nice to have. And as far as your gun, just sat it in at about 100 yards. Uh, if you can hit uh, zero at 100 yards, you're usually good out to a couple of hundred guns with most uh, most guns that are made today. And just about any caliber that's suitable for deer is good. Uh, you know, anything from a I, I steer away from 22 caliber guns for for gun, for deer, but they're very capable of killing a deer. So any any caliber center fire rifle is sufficient. I think bullet selection is probably more important than the caliber. Um, and today's manufacturers have done a really good job of identifying on the box of ammunition what animals it's good for. Uh, any kind of uh, most of those boxes have a symbol for a deer or coyote or a elk or whatever it happens to be. So any kind of uh, soft core bullet that'll mushroom real well um, when it hits a deer is uh, plenty sufficient. Again, keep it simple. One of the most important things I think you can carry into the deer woods with you is a set of shooting sticks, something to rest that gun on while you're shooting it. It makes it a whole lot easier to hold steady on uh, your target. What's next? Strategies. You know, deer have basically three different senses, vision, hearing, and smell. Um, vision, I think most of the time you can beat a deer's vision if you just sit still. And, you know, I could talk an hour on their ability to, to see 280 degrees and uh you know, the eyes are mounted on the side of their head so they can see, uh, even when they're not really looking your way, they can still pick up movement. So if you are uh, if you just get good ground cover behind you and sit still, you can usually beat their, their vision, especially out, you know, when they're 100 yards away. And hearing, boy, they can, they don't hear a whole lot better than we do, I don't think, maybe some, but they've got the ability to, with those big ears to be able to pinpoint where you're at. And they hear noises in the woods all the time and they know what noises are natural and they know what noises aren't. So just keep that in mind, just be as quiet and as still as you can. Smell, I think is the most difficult one to overcome. Uh, be pretty ob observant of your, of your scent control. Um, and I really don't know if you can beat a deer's sense of smell, but the better job you do of controlling your scent, the smaller footprints you leave. And it's not just the deer that come in downwind from you. You always want to keep the deer um, upwind from you. Uh, but they can, they, they can smell where you've been. When you walk through the woods down a trail, they'll be able to uh, pick up that scent off the ground and off the the limbs and, and grass and stuff that you touch on your way in. So avoid trying to walk across or in those deer trails. And always approach and exit your hunting area with the wind in mind. If you think they're bedding in a particular area, try to approach your stand where they won't be able to pick you off coming in and out. Uh, the other thing about strategies is, is it's always best to hunt dawn and dusk. That's when the deer are most likely to be on their feet and moving around. But I saw some deer two weeks ago at two o'clock in the afternoon, walking out across the field, just like they had good sense. So you never know when they're going to be out and about, but if you got to limit your time, do it at dawn and dusk. And be alert and be ready at all times because it happens fast when you're out there. They can slip up on you. And before you know they're there, they're out there. So you got to always be ready. And hang up and hunt. I bet you cell phones have caused more people more deer than any other thing. And I, I'm guilty of it sitting in the deer blind, looking at my phone and look up and by gosh, there's a deer. And how did he get there and where did he come from? I don't know, but 
he's there. So my best advice is, is to hang up and hunt. And then take high percentage ethical shots. I think that's the next. Um, there you go. I just want to touch on this a minute. Um, high percentage shots and ethical shots. And this is, this is a, a deer's anatomy. You see where his heart is. You see where the lungs are in the liver. Well, you want to shoot in that lung and heart area. That's where you want to shoot. The problem is this is a broadside shot. What's next, Casey? A broadside shot, you don't get very many of those. But when you do, you can see the area there on that deer, and that's where you want to shoot. Um, and the best advice I can give you on taking a shot is shoot for the exit hole. Give me the next slide. So this, this is a quartering away, which is probably the best shot angle you can get. It's highly ethical and it's highly successful, but you want to shoot for the exit hole. So if, I don't know if y'all can see that in the upper right-hand corner of that picture, that would be a uh, looking down on that deer quartering away. So if you shoot for the exit hole, which would be that line running through there, you're going to get both lungs with that shot. So that's really the best shot you can get. What's next? Quartering to you, that's a low percentage shot, especially with a bow. Um, it, it's a pretty decent shot for a rifle, but you've got to go through that, that bone to get both lungs. Uh, with a light caliber um, gun, a 22 250 or 223 or some of those lighter caliber guns, that starts to lower your odds at killing that deer quickly. What's next? But the most important strategy you can take to the fields with you is to have fun, especially if you're taking a kid. Remember that it's the kids hunt. When they get ready to go, it's probably time to go. If you don't take them home or take them back to camp, when they're ready, they're not going to want to go with you the next time. Thank you, Rick. That was a good overview. Um, okay, so next, Bobby, I was just, if you're okay with being on deck, I, we were going to talk a little bit about what, what was your, what did you designate his topic over? Because you kind of covered a little bit of everything. So more like ethics and safety. Yeah, safety that I was okay. supposed to kind of talk about. So, um, well, welcome everybody. I'm not sure what your, your experience level is. Uh, I, I don't know who all's on the call, but um, my understanding is I'm assuming that most of you are fairly new to hunting. So I kind of broke this down a basic uh, deal, but firearm safety uh, for this youth weekend is, is a must. You know, you're um, even though you're taking a, a youth hunting, uh, keep in mind that you're the adult and you need to kind of watch over them and make sure they're doing things correctly. Um, always treat the firearm as if it's loaded. You know, we uh, a lot of hunting accidents happen because we assume that the gun is not loaded and we do things that we're not supposed to be doing with a firearm and uh, cause an accidental discharge. Um, if you carry the, the rifle or, or the weapon or, or the child, the youth carries it, make sure that the muzzle is always pointed in a safe direction. Um, never point a firearm at um, yourself or others, uh, you know, to, to test it or look at it or anything like that. Uh, keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction at all times, um, either up um, on a sling or down at the dirt, uh, or you can you know carry it by uh, cradling it just as long as someone's not walking beside you on stuff like that. Um, a lot of people who are new to firearms has a natural instinct of to immediately put their finger on the trigger. Uh, you know, a lot of youths I've seen do this. So you want to kind of correct them and make sure they don't put their finger on the trigger until ready to fire. Um, even when they're trying to sight in the gun and uh, get um, the gun on target, uh, you know, I kind of always have them put their finger up beside the trigger on, on the stock um, of the gun. And then when they're ready uh, or got the uh, what they're planning on shooting in, in sight, then they can move their finger down and uh, to the trigger and get ready to, to shoot. So I'm kind of watching that as I'm, I'm with the uh, the youth in the uh, the uh, blind or the stand. Uh, you know, another thing is is don't 
uh, take a shot unless you are aware of your target and what's behind it. Uh, you know, I've I've even had mistaken thinking that something was a deer, uh, and come to find out, it was a uh, person uh, that was wearing brown camouflage. Uh, they look just like a deer at a couple hundred yards coming through the woods. So uh, don't assume that it's an animal until you're for sure what it is uh, on that. And then make sure that you don't shoot, uh, you know, what's behind there. Uh, you you have property lines, uh, and you know a lot of people think the bullets may stop at the property line, but they don't. So what's across that fence that you may hit? Is there a building? Is there a house? Is there a truck? Is there a person? Um, stuff like that. Uh, you know, if, if you're hunting on a, a hill and the animal is what we call skylighted, you don't want to try to take that shot because if you do miss, uh, that bullet can go a long ways uh, before it comes back down to the, the ground. Um, Rick talked about using binoculars. I agree. Uh, a lot of people will use their scope as binoculars, uh, and that's not a very fun feeling when you realize that someone's looking um, at you through their scope because they're pointing a gun at you. Uh, and I know some, uh, Jacob can probably elaborate as game wardens, they really don't like that um, on that part. So binoculars um, is a great tool. Do not, and if you don't have binoculars, a range finder is kind of a substitute, but do not use the, the scope for uh, binoculars on that. You know, if you're ever out with somebody and they're hunting and they're not following the rules and they just hard headed and they don't want to do that, follow the rules. I won't hunt with those people anymore. Um, I will, um, and I'll, I won't make an excuse about it. I just tell them that I don't feel safe hunting with you. Uh, and I'll make my way back to the vehicle, uh, and stuff like that. It's good to, you know, whatever you guys do, uh, this weekend with your youth, keep in mind, they're watching you and they're picking up everything, good habits and bad habits from you, uh, while you're doing that. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, you always unload your firearm and examine the barrel if you was to fall. So if they were walking and they trip and fall, don't just keep going to the stand. Stop. Make sure the gun's unloaded. Uh, and then examine the barrel. Make sure there's no debris inside that barrel. Um, I've seen cases before of barrels blowing up because they'll be uh, partially filled with dirt, mud, snow, sand, stuff like that. And the bullet, you know, is designed to to fit tightly in that barrel as it goes through the, uh, the rifling of the barrel on that. Um, and if there is dirt, you know, it's best just to go back to the vehicle and, and go back home and clean your gun and give that hunt up versus take a chance of getting yourself hurt or your, your child hurt uh, on there. Uh, you know, don't use uh, drugs or alcohol. Um, you know, a lot of people, even a uh, prescription medicine, if you're prescribed a uh, medicine that can cause you to be drowsy or, um, you know, moods, you know, different uh, altered mental status, and uh, you don't want to go out there, and you definitely don't want uh, kids to to have any of that. Um, Rick talked about ammunition. You know, I agree with him. I'm not a two two three fan. Um, I think a lot of parents let their kids shoot a two two three rifle or a twenty two two fifty, and it will uh, harvest a deer. It will ethically kill a deer. But what I found with with kids, their shot accuracy is not the greatest, and if they hit the deer in other places where Rick showed us, um, a lot of times those deer are wounded. And uh, worst case scenario, they they run off and um, pass away, um, and we're not able to find a blood trail. Uh, those small caliber guns don't leave very good blood trails. Um, the youth I take hunting, um, I my smallest caliber I use is a 243, but I also agree with Rick on the uh, the type of bullet. I use a heavy uh, 95 grain bullet uh, nozzler ballistic tip that gets, gets a good penetration because it's a heavier bullet and it expands very well and it leaves a good blood trail. I have tracked um, deer that's been shot with 243s. I actually, one deer was shot five times in the chest uh, and we didn't find any blood. We just happened to um, luckily find it uh, a ways out. Otherwise, it was more luck that we found it than anything else. And then lastly, don't shoot at water or hard, hard objects. Uh, water can ricochet your bullets. And uh, they'll just like skipping a rock across a, a pond or a lake, 
uh, that bullet can do the same thing and there's no way to tell when you're doing that you know whoever's holding the gun is responsible for the safe handling of the firearm so um even though you may not be holding the firearm uh you kind of you're there as to kind of mentor the the youth during this time and um you want to teach them proper gun safety too again because some of the four main things is to treat every gun as if it's loaded um keep that direction of the muzzle if 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 by some reason the child uh, messes up and doesn't keep the barrel in a, in a safe direction, you know, don't yell at them or anything like that. Correct them. Uh, don't let it happen again, but, you know, kind of watch the way we, we do it. Uh, make sure they keep their trigger finger off the, the trigger and uh, make sure they're, they're aware of the target and that you're aware of the target and they're shooting what, what you both have identified as a legal um, animal for uh, Oklahoma. So, that's kind of short and sweet, Casey. No, that was great. Thank you, Bobby. Um, okay, now that we've covered safety and the deer hunting strategies and some gear and firearm stuff, I'm going to pass it over to Jacob. He's going to go over some regulations and make sure you guys are legal in the field for this weekend. Okay, guys. Uh, like I said, I'm Jacob Perry, State Game Warden. So just one thing to start off, and I've had so many calls over it in the last few days, make sure you have permission on the property you're on. I've I've had like five or six trespass calls every single day. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, make sure you got permission. That's number one. After that, so what do you need to go out there? Uh, so the youth uh, licenses, are, they're very simple, but they can kind of seem complicated if you don't, you know, if you're new to it or whatever. I get lots of questions on it. So just to clarify, so if you are under 16, you are exempt from a hunting license. You do not have to have a hunting license. All you have to have is a deer license for the deer you intend to harvest. So say I, I have a 14 year old kid that wants to go hunting. He does not have to have a annual hunting license. He just has to have a youth deer gun license, either antlered or antlerless or both, depending on what he wants to harvest. The uh, uh, if I, and, and so for hunter safety, so you do not have to have hunter safety to hunt in Oklahoma. If you are under the age of 31 and you have not taken hunter safety, you have to go with a, a licensed hunter that's 18 years or older. Uh, and then they just have to be able to take immediate control of that firearm at any time. So anybody can hunt. They just have to be under that apprentice designation. And when you buy your licenses, I've had probably 100 questions on it the last couple of days. For a youth license, you'll go to it. It'll say youth hunting license. It's going to ask for your hunter safety number scroll down and select that apprentice designation if you don't have hunter safety it's that easy but i get calls on it a lot of people have issues they just don't scroll down uh, so do that so if i'm 16 years old well then 16 uh until 17 you know after you're 18 you're not a youth anymore but 16 and 17 at that point you have to have a youth hunting license and a youth deer license for each deer you're trying to harvest so if i wanted to shoot a doe and a buck i would uh, get my youth deer uh, antlered and antlerless license on top of my youth hunting license and that's covered so when you buy these licenses it is actually under the account of the the youth hunter so if my son is going to hunt i would make him an account and then i would buy his licenses and check in his deer underneath his account we have a lot of people that think that they have their license and they'll just let their kids shoot a deer and check it in under their name well that's illegal uh and a lot of people get in a bind over that every year Depending on the intent, you know, we kind of go different routes as far as, you know, punishment for that. But it has to be under the kid's name and checked in under the kid's name. You can't do it. I can't have my son shoot a deer and check it in under my license just because I have a lifetime. So now you got that. <clears throat> You're all, all legal. You have your licenses. You got permission to go. Uh, so now we need to make sure that our, our hunting method is legal. So our firearms uh, restrictions are super relaxed. We're probably more relaxed than they should be. All you have to have is a center fire rifle that shoots a uh, 55 grain soft nose or hollow point bullet. Uh, so basically your 223 and up is gonna qualify under that. One thing that I'm seeing more and more as new people get into it, the different kinds of ammunition. So there is a bullet called a full metal jacket and that is just a, a copper bullet. And that when you shoot something with it, it's just like shooting a pencil through it. It's just a straight hole, there's no expansion. Uh, that's why we require a soft nose or a hollow point bullet because when those shoot, they expand and it's a more lethal kill. I do not recommend shooting animals with full metal jacket ammo and it's also illegal. So make sure that you 
uh, wash that, especially in your like two, two, three calibers, because that's bulk ammunition is usually that full metal jacket uh, type, fully copper sleeved. Uh, got your license, got legal stuff. Get out there. So legal hunting uh, hours for deer is 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after. Uh, so that's the time that you can hunt. You can be in the woods before and after that. Sunset. Sunset yeah, 30 minutes before sunset to 30 minutes after sunset. Uh, you can be out there before and after. You just can't uh, harvest an animal at that time. Uh, at that point, you're good to go. You got to wear hunter orange. So uh, dad and kid need to wear hunter orange. Has to be 400 square inches. I'm not going to come out there and measure you. Basically, what it boils down to is wear uh, some sort of orange hat, some sort of orange vest. Uh, you can wear more than that. Uh, you just can't wear less than that. Be cautious if you're in a ground blind or something. Throw that orange on, on the blind. You still have to wear it inside the blind. Uh, from the time you get to your hunting area to the time you leave, you have to have that orange on. So you can't get in your tree stand, take it off, and hang it up on the tree. You need to have that on you uh, the whole time you're in the field. So if, if you harvest an animal while you're cleaning that animal, make sure you have that on. That's even more important because you're going to be with an animal. Uh, somebody could mistake that. Uh, like I said, trespassing is an extremely common call I get. If you think you're the only one hunting a piece of property, you're mistaken because somebody is going to slip in and try to hunt it. Or like Bobby said, bullets don't stop at fence lines. So a lot of times property is the only place that's clear and you can see a ways is on the fence line. You have two people on different properties hunting within 50 yards of each other. Wearing that orange helps you know who's around and, and can help you make a safe shot. Uh, so just be cautious of that. Uh, after that, if you are uh, fortunate enough to harvest something, you need to put a field tag on it. A field tag can be anything as long as it has your name, license number, time and date of harvest. So attach that to the carcass first thing. Uh, you have 24 hours to check that animal in on our e-check system. Like I said, make sure the youth hunter checks that in under their account and uh, get it checked in. Uh, that confirmation number needs to stay with that animal until it gets to its place of final consumption, either uh, your house or wherever you're going to process that. If you take it to a processor, they will ask you for all that information. They should keep that number with the deer until they send it back with you. Uh, safety wise, that's about it. So Bobby did a good job covering that. Uh, the scope on the rifle thing, you know, these young kids, they'll get bored. They want to kind of look at stuff. If you're not sure what something is, don't throw your rifle up and let them look through that scope. Uh, if I'm in the field and I'm checking hunters and they see me walking through the woods, not sure what they are. If they're pointing a rifle at me, I think I'm about to get shot, and I'm usually not near as pleasant as I could be if, you know, they didn't have that. So binoculars are a great investment. Uh, they have some very inexpensive binoculars. It's definitely worth the wait. Gives the kids something to do. You know, if there's a squirrel or something in a tree, they can safely look up at that squirrel and get a close-up view of it without having to sling the rifle around. Uh, that is about it. If you shoot an animal and it crosses a property line, you do not have permission to go get that animal. You have to get permission from that private property owner. Uh, wherever you're hunting at, I would recommend, you know, getting get in touch with those guys anyways. Uh, usually it's it's a pretty easy conversation to have. and the, They would normally be pretty happy for your uh, kid to go be able to pick up their deer off their place. They might want to come help. Mm. Other than that, that is about it on the regulations. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Um, so if you have questions, just type them in the chat box. I do want to go over a few things. Uh, one is public hunting areas. Um, and then two is I just want to talk about our hunter education classes that we have available and kind of how to navigate these uh, virtual courses on our outdoor calendar, just so you guys know how to get to these in the future. Or if you're interested in signing up for a in-person um, hunter ed class, then that's also an option too. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And I'm going to go to our wildlifedepartment.com page. And um, so really, this is this is Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation's website, and it's literally called wildlifedepartment.com. And so this is our main page. Uh, this is a really awesome outdoor journal that I, um, if you got an email from me, you I tag this in the email. Um, but these are some great tips and stuff. We kind of are going over all this already, but it's a good thing to have kind of down on paper here. Um, but if you were going to go look at our public hunting areas here in Oklahoma, you would go to hunting tab and then you would go down to where to hunt. And then it talks a little bit about how, like what type of lands we manage, why we manage them, how we manage them. We have WMAs, which are wildlife management area lists. We have 
our um, commercial hunt area list. We have our Oklahoma Land Access Program. Um, and this, I do believe for this year, I don't think that they, they're doing the permit because in our regulations, it says nothing about that. So that must have been um, rumblings for next year. So don't worry about that for right now. Um, if you're concerned about that and you want to get double check, which always double check, then maybe call your local game warden. But so I, I would click on, actually, I kind of like this interactive map. So that was a list of all the WMAs. If you know where you're wanting to go, I guess I'll just go back to this first. If you know where you want to go, let's say you want to go to Fort Gibson um, public hunting area. You click on that. And then the, here's all the info about it. It shows um, the contacts, the hunting contacts, driving directions, species of interest, et cetera. And there are actual um, PDF maps available. But I really like if we were to go to our WMA interactive maps. To me, this is way more handy because you can actually use these on your, you can view these on your phones too out in the field. Um, always has a disclaimer here. So these you can zoom in and you can actually see I think this is probably Fort Gibson. So like say if we're gonna go to Fort Gibson right here, you can click on these. It shows your it shows a little bit of information about it. You can do the topos, you can see where the parking areas are, you can see I mean, you would just open up your layer, uh, your legend list, and you can be able to see um this topo overlay. You'd be able to see um, a little bit more in detail. You can change your base map to aerial. So this is really, to me, this is pretty dang handy here. Um, and you can look at this on all of your, um, all of the WMAs that we have. And the topo is pretty handy too. You can kind of see where your valleys and your um, high tops are. So this is one of the areas you can go look at. And I grab this and go to our Oklahoma Land Access Program. And what these areas are are we lease private land for public hunting. Um, so they're from they're they're leased from private landowners and it opens it up for public hunting. Now there's a few areas of um, that are uh, what do I call it now. It's um, limited access drawings, which are typically close to metropolitan areas. Um, which is very handy, but I can show you how to, uh, where to go to look at signing up for these. And it's like a day by day situation, um, like a daily draw. Uh, this is the app that you can use to view uh, these, the OLAP maps on your phone. And you can also view those WMAs maps on your phone. So it's called ArcGIS Field Maps. Really handy. You can, if you have an iPhone or a Droid, you can get driving directions to these places. So you set it on your phone. If you have Apple Play on your, on your truck, you just set it parking or you set it to the parking area and it'll just take you right there. You don't have to worry about it. And it's not like Onyx where you have to look at like crossroads and stuff and then try to go from there and try to find them. So um, I'm going to click on the OLAP map directory just because you can see it's a little different interface, um, but it's still really nice. And so all these archery shotgun only uh, that wouldn't qualify for rifles. So um, a lot of OLAP properties are not rifle. Um, I just realized that now, so it's probably not, if we're doing youth rifle weekend, this is probably not as pertinent to you. But in the future, if you would like to go outside of this rifle season and you wanna make a, a go of um, archery the rest of the year, these all these properties that have shotgun and archery, or shotgun and broadheads on them are, are um, available for you guys to use. And then, I don't know if, I'm not sure the regulations on these since this is fairly new for me, but these are the um, the daily draw areas. And if you were to click on that, is limited access. Uh, and you, I can show you how to sign up for those. So that is just a quick kind of overview. Oh, my tab here, jeez. Uh, my way so I can check my tabs. Um, okay. Sorry guys, I'm trying to maneuver this and that thing gets popped up on there. Okay, so this is our gooutdoorsoklahoma.com um, page and this is where you can view your controlled hunts, you can view your licenses, you can check in your deer. Um, we have all of our uh, 
our events and our classes here. So I'm going to hit, and you would have to make an account for this and set up an account, but you hit go to site. And so this is, this is where you can look at all of your Hunter education classes. You have your OLAP check-ins right here. Um, and that's a whole different field. I'm actually not super familiar with this. You can look at the different areas and it's just, it's pretty intuitive. You just have to look, um, it'll show one of one seats available. So, it, and it's a daily draw and it'll say like one's already been reached. So I think you can plan them out for Thursday. It'll, it'll span all the way out until a couple weeks from now. So, um, but that's how you do for those Oklahoma, those limited access areas. But what I wanted to show you guys, for anybody that's interested in doing an in-person hunter med class, if you, these are all of our events. You can see that our um, Learn to Hunt Youth Deer season is on here. But this is just uh, all of them. If you wanted to filter it to do a hunter education course, uh, you can scroll down here and you can kind of see where all these are popping up. We don't only have three left. Actually, this one was today, but we only have three left and one's in Jinx, or two left, sorry, and one, one's in Jinx and one's in Omega. And I'm not even, I guess that might be over here. Um, so it's kind of limited. Uh, the Jinx one would probably be pretty handy. Um, hit the aquarium up or something while you're at it. But uh, that's how you go to our Hunter Education in-person courses. And then if you were going to look at more classes like this, you go to your Hunt and Learns, and you can see all the all the classes we have scheduled for later. We have quite a bit. We have our uh, muzzleloading coming up, our quail pheasant forever, our quail and pheasant classes, and then we have our waterfowl and then rifle, and then we'll have some more deer processing and holiday antlerless classes as well. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. And if you guys are new to hunting and you're wanting to get plugged in on the local level and meet people. Um, that are like-minded like you guys uh, that want to hunt uh, and talk about hunting. The most, um, the best thing I can encourage you guys to do is join a local uh, conservation organization like NWTF, like OHA or Quail or Pheasant Forever or DU um, or Delta. They're, they're everywhere. We have backcountry hunters and anglers. But at the local level, if you were to meet people like that and get plugged in, um, do some of their outreach events, uh, you can learn a lot. And those people kind of become a really good local source for you. Um, you kind of build a family with these guys and you will meet a lot of good mentors and a lot of knowledgeable people that may have connections or may help you out if you're starting out hunting for the first time. So I wanna highly encourage you guys to look into uh, doing some sort of conservation organization at the local level, just within you know, driving 30 minutes or so. So, and that's what these guys are, Oklahoma Hunters and Anglers. They are a new conservation organization here in Oklahoma, nonprofit. And so I just think that talking about that in general and getting plugged in at your local level is, I'd be remiss if you were trying to uh, start this journey. It's the easiest way to stay plugged in is if you were to meet people, like-minded people that like to hunt and fish. So um I do want to open this up now to a Q&A of some sort, if you want to. Um, it's such a small group. If you guys wanted to just unmute yourselves and you have any questions for these gentlemen or myself, uh, just go ahead and ask us now. Um, we got a pretty good amount of time. We have 20 minutes up to that we can chat about anything and everything. So please ask away. Or if you guys think I missed anything, speakers, please speak up. I do want to mention, I was thinking, some people think about um, when you're wearing orange, I was going to interrupt you earlier, but I just said, thought I would save it for this, that breakup orange camo. What does everybody think about that? Yeah, the camo orange, I mean, it is, it is legal to use, but it is not near as effective. <laughs> it, the camo, it's just not near as effective. The, the whole point of hunter orange is to keep you from getting shot. The deer don't see it hunters do. I mean, you can make it more concealing where hunters don't see you, but then you're kind of defeating the purpose too. So it is legal to wear. I would recommend solid blaze orange. That's the safest thing to wear, especially if you got kids out there. I mean, every year, time and time again, we have incidents and accidents and stuff, and it's because people aren't taking that seriously. 
I, I am a very nice and easygoing game warden. I do not cut breaks on Hunter Orange because it's that serious to me. I would much rather write you a small ticket than, you know, have to work an accident where you or somebody else is shot and killed or, or just seriously hurt. That's very true. He won't let me walk out of the house during rifle season with the OSU orange hat on. Well, I agree because, um, you know, that's the only color in the woods that's not – or only – color that's not in the woods and it's very noticeable from a long distance away and like i said earlier the the, the property lines the bullets don't stop um and the, some of these rifles can shoot a couple miles so the more you're you stand out the, the less likely you are to get shot the, the other thing too on on safety i don't know if any of you guys are using elevated blinds but if you're using an elevated blind stand or whatever be careful on that that's we have a lot of falls from that i'm a um, old paramedic firefighter that's had to respond to um, these instances where people get up in a tree from a, a homemade stand or they use a climbing stand or a lock-on stand and they don't use any type of fall arrest system and they they fall out so if you're using a like a double uh, seated uh, ladder stand make sure it's good you know if it's something that was put up last year uh, go out before season to make sure the straps are good that you know, squirrels didn't chew the straps or the sun didn't dry rot the straps, stuff like that before you and your, your child starts climbing up in the, the stand uh, because those things can be um, pretty dangerous. And then um, we shouldn't have, well, we won't have for the most part, hypothermia issues this time of year, but, you know, as it gets colder, uh, make sure your kids, you know, we, we dress ourselves and we know what it's comfortable for us, but a lot of times the kids don't know to tell us that they're uncomfortable and that and we sometimes put them in boots that are too small or shoes that's too small and cram you know boot socks on them to keep their feet warm and uh next thing you know they're 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 shivering and it's um, not a pleasant experience for them uh to be out there and uh so just think about them and their comfort um for that and if you hunt later on this season uh, on that part also, when you're going out there, um, when you're walking out to your stand, a lot of times you can get sweaty. So don't, um, like a big tip of mine is like, even though it, you start off and you're cold, don't put all your gear on, all your layers on, because by the time you get out that stand, you're going to be very sweaty. And then when you, when your body calms down and cools down, you're going to chill because you'll have sweat under, under you or in, in all those layers and stuff. So Try to tie your jacket around your waist, kids jacket around their waist and stuff before you head out there and then layer up right before you get into your stand. That'll avoid chilling. And Rick is a, um, I was listening to his uh, presentation and you got to understand Rick, Rick, Rick only shoots big bucks. Um, he's, he's a, what I would call a trophy hunter and everything. So, you know, he I wishes. raised triplet boys, um, and I took I took my boys hunting ever since they were six years old. I took all three of them at, at one time, um, and it was fun. I made a lot of memories with them. But you know, some of the things I did, if nowadays with iPads and and stuff like that, I'd let them take the phones out there, um, and and let them play and have fun. You know, snacks. I mean, that's the best part. Little Debbie, I guarantee you, their stock goes up this time of year because of all the hunters. But you know, I heard someone talk about taking goldfish um, crackers. Uh, and let them munch on that, you know, and um, just let them have fun and, and don't put pressure on them to harvest something. Uh, if they do, great. Congratulate them. Uh, if they miss, congratulate them. You know, um, this this is not an easy thing to do. and They're learning. And um, if you want to keep them into hunting, then you got to you got to congratulate them and stuff like that. And the other thing I realized with my kids is um when they want to go, we win. You know, now if it's prime time, we got out there, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon. And it just now it's the last hour before uh, dark. You know, that's the prime time for deer to move. If they want to go, I'll I'll try to encourage them to stay that, and explain to them that this is the best time to for us to see a deer. Uh, but if they're if they're bored, they're ready to go. I mean, it's their hunt. Let's pack up and, and go uh, because I I don't want to ruin that I've seen parents take and ruin their kids uh, for that. And then on the other hand, we talked about small guns, but I've also seen parents take large guns and have kids try to shoot too big of guns. That's too big for them. And, and that can 
make a kid gun shy or at least flinch every time they shoot now. Um, so just watch, you know, look at your kid, uh, address your, your, your needs for your kid and, um, um, do that. So Jacob, I think that's a question for you. Okay. So, uh, basically the, the landowner agriculture exemption. So if you are the landowner or you are on a property that you agriculturally agriculturally lease, so it's like you have your farm tax, you have an ag lease to run cattle or do farming or something like that, you are exempt from the annual hunting license. You still have to buy a deer license for each tat or each deer that you harvest. Uh, so you would still have to buy, you know, an antlered deer gun license for your kid. Uh, now, your kid does not own the property. Uh, so if it's like an ag lease or something, probably not going to be a huge deal, but they are supposed to have their license still. Uh, but it, like, if I say I hunt on my own place, I'm technically exempt from the annual hunting license. I just have to buy my deer licenses. Another thing I didn't touch on on that, you have to buy those before you go into the field. So if I come out there and you shoot a deer, check it in and I see, okay, well, you shot this deer at five o'clock, but you didn't buy your license till five 30. Well, that's illegal. You're hunting without a license at that point. So make sure you have your license before you go in the field. Uh, that agricultural landowner exemption, uh, th did that answer your questions on that or do you have anything else? It's kind of confused. Basically, if you own it or you have an agricultural lease, you're exempt from the hunting license. Jacob, can you touch on, and I don't know how to say it, but what constitutes a buck antler-wise? Uh, okay, so I was reading the other question there. So uh, an antler deer is anything with uh, antlers three inch above the natural hairline. So technically, we don't have bucks and does. We have antlered and antlerless. So if, if it is a little button buck, you know, they have nubs that are this big, that is considered an antlerless deer. But once they hit that three inch mark and they're over three inches, then they're considered an antler deer. Uh, if something happens, you have an antlerless tag, you shoot one, it ends up being a little bit bigger than that. Call your local game warden. We can figure it out. Not a big deal. If you hide it and try to get away with it, we get a tip on it. Well, then you're in violation and it can be a pretty hefty fine. But just be honest. I mean, we're not out there trying to hammer a guy that accidentally shot a, uh, you know, a little buck thing that's dope. It's happened to all of us. You know, it's not a big deal. Just be honest about it. Uh, yes. So that's a very good question. I should have touched on that. So, yes, there are seasons and, and limits. Uh, so according to the agriculture lease or landowner exemption it's all the same as a statewide season so you just have to abide by the statewide season but for this youth season what we're looking into now it, it's a friday saturday sunday season uh, so it's those three days and you can harvest an antlered and an antlerless deer with the appropriate licenses so if you want to shoot both you buy a, a youth uh, deer gun antlered and a deer gun antlerless license that covers you for both of them uh, you know, each season has different regulations for it. Like archery season, you can shoot more. Rifle season, you can shoot different. The youth deer gun license, uh, it does not count towards your season limit. Oh, actually, I think it does count your season limit. I lied. The, the, the buck license will count. You can harvest another doe during the hol the regular gun season, though. So, I think that's saying it one more time, so it does like if you shoot a bucket, it does count towards your two. Yes, yeah. If you shoot well for your rifle, it counts for your rifle. Okay. okay. Anybody else have any questions? And was that clear on there, Jason? Good deal. I'd encourage you guys, if you have questions, this is the place to be. I was reading earlier on a Facebook post, somebody was asking questions, and, and there were some flat wrong answers given uh, in that post. So uh, please don't go to Facebook and ask questions because you will get told the wrong answer. And it's not that they're doing it intentionally. It's just a lot of people don't know the, the regulations and stuff like that. And I encourage you, all game wardens have their phone numbers in the, the uh, game book. You know, find the county you're in and call that game warden up. Uh, if they're busy, you know, I've, I've called my game warden up. Um, we had an issue. Rick came out and hunted with me, and we had trouble uh, checking the deer in. And, you know, I called called the game warden. 
to tell him what's that we're having trouble and you know he was busy and said he'd call us back well i gave him a couple of hours and um still called him again because he didn't call me back you know that they they are busy this time of year and and um told him what we what the trouble was and i wanted him to make sure that that we did harvest the deer and that we were trying to check it in but we were having trouble with the app and he was very understanding and got on there and, and checked it in for us gave it comp comp confirmation number and and that but don't don't go to facebook if you can avoid it okay so i miss Belk. i'm going to clear something up so I, I said it right the first time if you shoot if you do not or you do shoot a buck in the youth season or you shoot an antlerless deer a doe it does not count towards your rifle license it counts towards your season limit but it doesn't count against your uh, your regular rifle season limit. And yes, the uh, youth licenses are good for the regular rifle season as well. So you don't have to buy separate licenses. If you buy a youth deer gun license, that will count for the regular rifle season. So they just asked that the youth license yeah, is good. Oh, okay, I didn't know if you. I thought you were just. Oh, right. Oh, good job. Okay. I would recommend to if you don't get a call back from your game warden, a lot of times if it's an easy question, they uh, respond to text pretty good too because sometimes they're not answering because they're sneaking up on somebody or something like that. But if they're sitting there watching somebody from afar, which you can guarantee you, you've probably been watched by a game warden a time or two and you didn't know it. But uh, if the, if they're doing that and they can respond to a text too. So if it's a simple yes question, um, shoot them a text or just, it's not yeah. yeah, feel free to reach out. Like Bobby said, if, if we don't answer, don't get back with you. You're not going to insult us by calling again. A, a lot of times I will text people because I'm in a situation where I can't talk. And I'll be like, hey, this is the game warden. Can't talk right now, but how can I help you? And a lot of times I can get it settled that way. If I can't, I'll give you a call as soon as I get back. Also, a lot of times I don't have enough service to get a call out. So having that text message option works pretty good. Speaking of that, I'm getting calls, getting calls this whole class. So I'll call that guy back. If he shoots me a text, I could probably shoot him a text. Right now. Yeah. Someone asked earlier and was shocked that is there a limit for how young you can be out in the field to hunt? No. Uh, so there, there's not. As long as you can safely. Uh, harvest a deer under that apprentice designation there is no limited or uh, you know minimum age requirements uh now if you go out and shoot a deer with your you know six month old child we'll probably have a conversation but uh, <laughs> as long as that kid you know three four i've seen kids four years old harvesting deer before so there's no minimum age requirement but also by lifetimes when they're like one day old like our son so <laughs> yeah we made that investment is anything like us, it's going to save us a lot of money. So, well, I'd like to extend the uh, uh, stand out to, to you guys that you, if you take your, your child out, um, we run uh, several Facebook groups um, through the OHA, um, but one of them is the Oklahoma Hunters and Anglers Facebook group. You know, uh, join that and, and share your pictures, even if you don't harvest anything. We'd love to see pictures of, of you guys out there with, with the youths and. And everything because uh you know that's um i've went through multiple stages in my life as far as hunting and the best stage so far i've been through was taking my own kids out there and and getting the memories from them and and that and, and that i can't beat that no there's no deer out there big enough for me to shoot that will replace one of my kids shooting a spike so um you know share share that with us we'd love to see them yeah and likewise oh sorry go ahead right Bobby, the only thing better than taking your kids is taking your grandkids. Um, I do want to elaborate on those photos, like what Bobby had said. Um, we, too, have on um, wildlifedepartment.com's website, we have a new feature called the tailgate. And um, it's a, you, you have to go through a submission process. But if you guys harvest any deer or have any fun pictures out hunting, we would love to see those. And you just go to that hunting tab that we were on where we went down to where to hunt. There's also the tailgate right there and you can go and submit your, your photos there for a chance to be featured. It gives us the wildlife department awesome, um, awesome, 
content, awesome media for our publications and stuff because we love seeing our constituents' real photos, not stage photos, um, out there doing the thing and hunting. So we would love to have your photos on there as well. You guys have any more questions? We're about to wrap up here. So I want to make sure we are, uh, we're good to go. Um, if you're typing right now, I do want to just mention why, while we get these last questions out of the way that this is recorded. Um, and so I will typically send the recording out like within the day or two. Um, and then I post it on YouTube on our, under our Learn to Hunt playlist. And I'll go ahead and put all of Rick and Bobby's contact information as well as mine. So if you do think of any questions afterwards to follow up with them or myself, um, I I would say get your local game warden if you have a game warden question, because it's going to be a lot easier to, to do that on your local level. Um, but yeah, I will follow back up with any um, pertinent information and links that I can have. So you're so welcome, guys. I'm so glad that this turned out to be a good meeting for you. And I hope you guys have a great, safe and successful weekend in the field. I just want to say thank you again to our speakers here for joining us today. Um, it was this was very, very valuable. So I yeah. sure appreciate it. And if you guys have questions, feel free to reach out before you get in the woods tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Go get them. Go Good get luck. Them. Good luck. Have fun. Bye-bye.